Welcome all of you to our colloquium. Uh, this is the uh, very meaningful colloquium in that this is the first uh, collaboration between the Center for Korean Studies and the Taiwanese Studies. So it's a very, <laughs> it has special meaning. Okay. Yeah. And uh, let me start off by introducing our the speaker today. Um, in fact, uh, it has been my my own tradition where I usually spend much time in introducing a speaker in a very extensive manner. Why? Because uh, I thought that way the audience could relate in so many different ways to, to the speaker. So if you bear with me, uh, I'll, I'll spend uh, more than a few minutes on introducing him. Okay. Uh, professor Kun Lee uh, currently is a distinguished university professor at the Seoul National University in the Department of Economics. Uh, he is currently serving as visiting professor with us at the JSIS, uh, teaching a course on the economy and business of China and Korea. Uh, he formally obtained a PhD in the Department of Economics at UC Berkeley. But he was trained, as I recall, as a China uh, uh, specialist. Uh, it's a very rare case uh, among Korean economists who specialized in specific country. Usually they go they for more or less theory or, or the economic, econometrics kind of approach, but he was an exception from the beginning. And then he came to the uh, uh, Seoul National University, uh, the, what, the 992. 992. And then since then, he has been with um, at the Seoul National University. He, I, I, on my part, I would like characterize his nickname as the uh, catch up economy, economist, uh, because he has spent so much time uh, in writing, lecturing on catch up economies over the years. So he even uh, the founded an institute for catch up economies. Uh, at the Seoul National University. And um, in terms of his uh, writings, uh, actually, he won the, uh, uh, the prize uh, on, uh, uh, he won the prize of Simpeda Prize 2014 uh, the, for his monograph on Simpeterian Analysis of Economic Catch Up 2013, which was published by Cambridge University. And then once again, 2019, the, another book by Cambridge in the name of in the title was The Art of Economic Catch-Up. So, but then since then he has published more than seven books, which are mostly published by major universities or major press. Uh, and then uh, the, he, I'm sure one of, maybe some of you already uh, read his uh, the, uh, columns uh, in many newspapers, including Project Syndicate. Uh, the, in fact, uh, the, I frequently came across the name in Japan Times, so uh, on my part. Previously, uh, he served as the vice chair of the National Economic Advisory Council of Republic of Korea where the chair and the, pre chair, the president of the uh, council is uh, South Korean president. So in other words, he was the second man uh, in that, uh, the uh, council. And uh, the, also he was a member of the Committee for Development or Policy of the United Nations. And then Global Federal Council member of the World Economic Forum uh, between 2016 and 19. And then he is now currently also a fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and then an, an editor of the journal Research Policy, and also an uh, associate editor for in the Industrial and Corporate, uh, corporate China. Uh, and then uh, his total citations received is about 13,500 with H index 55 and one I-10 index of 145. So I can go on and on, but then for the sake of time, I'll stop here and then let me introduce the uh, Professor Kundi over here. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Professor Ha, also Jackson School, for having me here as a meeting professor, also arranging this opportunity to give a seminar in this audience. Actually, as introduced by Ha, as a Korean studying in China, in the US was not that easy. <laughs> okay, so my thesis about China and back in Korea, I studied Korea and other Asian countries. Okay, so. Uh, today's topic is about the uh, current issues, which is U.S.-China rivalry and the position of Korea and Taiwan. Actually, uh, I've been given this talk, a similar topic, in another Washington name university, which is uh, George Washington University in D.C. Also, talk in Beijing on the, the think tank of State Council, also Taipei, also Copenhagen. And I hope this will be the last seminar before I submit final version of my paper to the same journal. Okay. So I'd like to have some interesting feedback from these audiences. <clears throat> so first, let me show this uh, graph of uh, post-pandemic recovery of major economies around the world. And, uh, uh, mostly, we are experiencing V-shaped recovery. We are showing very uh, uh, flexible turn turnaround. China used to be uh, showing very high growth despite this pandemic, but China has a later lockdown uh, in 2021. That's why China having kind of W-shaped recovery compared to other V-shaped recovery of major market economy. Anyway, so are we going back to normal? And the answer is probably no, because we are now entering quite different world. Okay. And the uh, um, word for new environment is deglobalization, also maybe decoupling. So which had been triggered by several events, first by 2008 global financial crisis, which was brought to financial globalization. Then we saw the 2016 Brexit major uh, event in for the deglobalization. Then with Trump, uh, we started the US-China trade war and the US starting charge import tariff against uh, China's export, which was major setback against trade-based globalization. Then further, we have a pandemic, which was a major blow to uh, production globalization or fragmented global value chain. So we are seeing shift of um, multilateral free trade regime uh, becoming replaced by small number based or uh, friend shoring or different uh, small number based uh, alliance based new types of GBCs. Then another blow is Russia and Ukraine war. So we are going to leave this new world for a couple of decades, I guess. It's a big challenge for the practical uh, the policies, also academicians too. Then specifically, uh, there are big change going on in GVC, global value chain in Asia globally. One important key theme is the exit China, getting out of China, which means reshoring or nearshoring. It was triggered by first US starting charge tariff against China, who, which was a push factor for trade division, exercise division. So company moving out of China and located in Vietnam or in Mexico. So that's the near story. Okay. And this was due to also rise of Chinese firms' competitiveness. They're getting very innovative nowadays. So by market competition, uh, Korean company and many other US companies losing in competition. For example, Samsung mobile phone. Market share used to be more than 20% in China, but now less than 0.3%. 0, 0 <laughs> Almost zero. Apple maintaining some market share, but Apple also having big trouble. Also, China's wage rate has risen uh, substantially, so it's no more making sense to locate factory in China. China is no more global factory, it's becoming market or different places. Then we have a, a technical change of digitalization, which means automation or smart factory, which means labor factor is no more important factor. You can uh, build your totally automated factory in home country or other country. We don't have to stay in China. 
Then after COVID-19, each country providing big incentives to bring back their factory home. So all these four factors are uh, making this phenomenon of uh, exit China. This shows the Korean location of FDI in Asia. Uh, China used to be the, the, the biggest location, okay. but it's replaced by Vietnam. Also in terms of uh, number of cases, in terms of uh, share of jobs. So Vietnam is the biggest hosting country of Korean FDI. Now, after Vietnam is now to USA. After US, IRA and Chipset, Korean companies are moving heavily to USA built factories. So it's a big change is going on in FDI. After that, so we have a change in trade structures. China has been number one trading partner for Korea, bigger than some of US and Japan. But now this year, or last year, US become number one again, replacing China as a bigger trading partner for Korea. This shows the, uh, the gap, gap, but more updated is the US hitting bigger than China as a, uh, Korea's export destination. More importantly, uh, Korea used to have a big surplus to trade with China, but now recently deficit. And whereas Korea getting big surplus with the US, almost 70 billion, about 10 times more than deficit with China. Why is increasing surplus with the US? Because trade follows FDI. Because you build more factory in USA, then trade follows. So I guess if new government in US might show some concern about rising Korean surplus with, with the US, but that's a good sign because that means Korea building more factory, investing in US. <laughs> so we end up invest, invest, expecting more to Korean factory in US. Okay. So it's a big change okay, in trade structures. And it's an example of Samsung in terms of China exit. Okay. Samsung entered China from uh, um, early 2000, building factories in uh, um, uh, uh, Shenzhen, smartphone factory, PC factory, and so on. But uh, from mid 2010, China, Samsung is exiting from China, but building factory in uh, Vietnam and so on. So now Vietnam become biggest uh, site of Samsung mobile phone. Samsung don't, uh, doesn't keep any assembly factory in U China anymore, anymore uh, the final assembly of mobile phone, PC, and whatever. Only keep three intermediate foot, which is memory, semiconductor, EV factories, MSAC is a picky circuit board component. So without these three intermediate part, all final assembly already out of China, already. or in uh, Vietnam, or in India, or Indonesia, or Mexico, and so okay. So China is no more global factories. So the China and US import decreased to less than half. Few Vietnam, India, and Mexico rises. This week, we have a news media report that Mexico replaced China as the number one uh, uh, the importing source of uh, for US. Okay. So uh, radical changes happening in global trade. So my uh, talk, remaining part, will be updating some chapters of my book on China's China technological leapfrogging and kind of catch up. I have a chapter on the uh, uh, China's several challenges and traps, and also several chapters on semiconductor. So today will be further update, which is my ongoing paper with uh, courses in mainly China, Singapore, and, uh, and Taipei. In the chapter two, chapter 10 of my book, I discussed uh, two traps facing China. One is middle income trap, the other is subsidies trap, which means that uh, because of a uh, um, hegemony war, uh, China facing kind of slowing down due to the US policies to contain rise of China's. Okay? Not a cold war, but uh, uh, the cold war situation. And I also discuss what are the uh, prospects of China getting beyond middle income trap. We can discuss in three factors. First, China is innovative enough, with China creating world class big business, or China doing okay in terms of inequalities. These are three major criteria to talk about 
mid-range gun truck prospect. In first criteria of innovation, China doing very well. Okay, in terms of uh, R&D expenditure GDP, also in terms of how many patents you are filing in US. Okay, and then also in, in world-class big business, in terms of Fortune Global 500 companies, China has already more than US. China has 132, US has 122 in the last year. Okay. But in terms of inequality, uh, China is still trouble, uh, having trouble with containing uh, rise of inequalities, like every country around the world. Okay. So the, uh, this shows the, the measurement of middle income trade, which is measured as uh, China's per capita GDP in PPP terms against US as a relative terms. So this shows that China's GDP now is about 30%, 29% US, whereas Korea, Japan is about 70%, Germany is about 90%, something. China already above Brazil and India. Okay? China's slope is very fast, very steady catch up. Okay? So if you extend last 10 years uh, record, China will reach 40% US in next 10 years. That means China joining high income status. In World Bank term, uh, high income status means that if you reach 40% of US income level per capita, that's high income. Korea reached that level around the late 1980s. Okay. So in this criteria, China seems to be doing well in terms of overcoming middle income trap. Okay. And this shows one basis uh, in terms of uh, number of US patent filed by major countries. Of course, US, Japan, number one and two. China just become number three. China surpassed Korea, Germany recently. Korea is number three, but now replaced by China. So that means China, although authoritarianism, they are very innovative in terms of at least by number of US patent. Very fast catch up by China. Also, India is catching up too. Okay. In terms of world-class big business made by Fortune 500 companies, US peak was early 2000. That's the before the IT bubble burst. US have 200 out of global 500, the best time of US, but keep declining. And also, uh, Japan's best period was mid 1990. At that time, Japan had 150. But now Japan become less than 50, more than half. And US decline matched by rise of China. China used to have only two in 1995, but now have a 135, more than US. <laughs> it's amazing uh, catch up because this input, because number of world class big business is very closely uh, following the economic uh, progress, economic growth. Okay. This so clearly. Japanese two lost decade and uh, um, some decline in US and rise of China. But in terms of inequalities, China is having, having same problem as US. This shows the rich top 10% share in the, their income. China is keep increasing, now rich more than 40%, which is almost same as USA. Okay, so two big giants having both trouble with uh, maintaining inequalities. Like uh, Northern Europe is much better, Sweden only 30%, and Taiwan is also there. Korea is also similar, 40%. Okay. So uh, in terms of innovation, big business, China doing well, but in terms of the inequality, uh, very uncertain. But now this is the uh, two cities today, TT, which is uh, China's size, economic size, getting uh, checked by US reaction. And I have important data. Uh, this table uh, I made up using IMF recent data showing that China peak was 2021. China's keep catching up, yes. Only less than 10% uh, early 2000 reached 76% in 2021. Since then, declined. First time China show decline in terms of size two years. First time. Also very sharp decline, just two years from 76% to 65 in two years. The first time China experienced such rapid big decline. Okay. So, so we can say that China peaked in 2020. 
Why 2021? This is the year China had a late lockdown in Shanghai. Shanghai almost one third of China's GDP. Very strict lockdown. And it has still lasting effect on China's recovery. Okay? It's not much due to US reaction, but due to a pandemic. <laughs> The lockdown stopped all the building of apartments and so on. That's the beginning of the real estate problem and the banking problem in China. Still uh, going. So before, people used to forecast that China reach U.S. size, overtake U.S. in 10 years. But that forecast is, is outdated. Maybe ta China will never able to catch up with U.S. <laughs> if you extend this uh, uh, recent uh, project uh, tra trajectory. If you take last 10 years, it's only uh, China 6% point catch up in 10 years. That means it takes uh, 60 years to overtake US. <laughs> but after six years, US keep increasing population, China will face population, population decrease. That means probably China will never able to uh, take up US in size. Okay. So very interesting phenomenon though, per capita income wise, China keep catching up 40% US level, but in terms of size, which is economic power, uh, China never able to uh, overtake US in sizes. Okay. So in that sense, US should thank pandemic. <laughs> okay. Anyway, but uh, that means still, still China will become very uh, similar size in next uh, decade, at least reach 80% US. But in so far in world history, no country has reached this size of US. Never Germany, never Japan. Japanese peak was uh, mid-1990. At the time, Japan reached about 75% US, 1955. But since then, Japan declined to now less than uh, 15%. So maybe China will not experience such rapid decline, but China will be now kind of muddling through or staggering around that level of 70 or 80 level for a while. But anyway, still that means world split into two big powers group, China block and US block. Okay. Or split in value chain, US led GBC versus China led GBC, because US working hard to build up GBC, going to IRA, IRA Act, and Chips Act, and so on. Also, we are divide the world in terms of value system. One is the Western democracy and uh, socialism with the Chinese style, or China, Russia, other the big uh, strong leader group, right? different uh, political system. Further, we have a Russia and Ukraine war, which uh, put Europe into more toward the US side. So, world is split. Okay. This is a very precarious situation. Although we are see some very interesting country like India. In the member of HOT and also member of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is China's security block. So in the very strange countries. <laughs> okay. We are seeing rise of the, the BRICS, plus six new members uh, joining BRICS. Okay. So there is kind of third line, third blocks of country too. But well, IMF has a very uh, uh, gloomy forecast that if world is getting more fragmented, world GDP will be less and less, depending on scenarios. Uh, optimist scenario even said uh, about 2% decline in world GDP, but more pessimistic scenario means that more than 10% decline in world GDP. So world will be getting a uh, uh, very weaker situation. But strangely, on US is very strong nowadays. <laughs> All economies are suffering, okay? Europe, and Imagine country suffering very a lot, weak economic situation. So some more uh, fact about GBC changes. In economics, we have a measurement of GBC. Uh, uh, this is graph of uh, GBC indicators. This uh, measures how many percent of US export, US export is using uh, imported foreign value added, uh, foreign intermediate part. Okay, so you, the higher means you are relying on foreign sources when you export. Like Vietnam, they export Samsung mobile phone, but a lot of them is imported from Korea. Vietnam use only the neighbors. Okay. So this was China is uh, relying on more GBC. China joined GBC 
importing a lot from intermediate from around the world. But since uh, 2003 or 4, it keeps declining. That means China domesticating formally imported intermediate part, all made in China. Okay, this happening every sector. This is aggregate features. So this world is US and Korea. We have nothing to sell China. That's why Korea end up trade deficit, where we used to have a surplus. Okay. Made everything made in China, except semiconductors. <laughs> okay, probably. Okay. I have the same graph for Korea. For increasing, decreasing, Korea also domesticate many intermediate part, but keep increasing again. Korea global, globalized. So this kind of, I see this standard pattern, normal pattern. Join GBC, build up some domestic chain, and global again. Okay. But the last part is gone in China because uh, China domesticating everything. Further, because of this US-China rivalry, China is now forced to rely more on their own technology and less on Western technology. So this pattern is keep going on further in China, every sector. So uh, we are seeing kind of a GBC rivalry in G or G2 eras. So we see high-tech worlds in major sectors of semiconductors, 5G, AI, batteries, and so on. Okay. So China is trying to reduce the reliance on Western technology. So it's a decoupling from Chinese perspective. So China doing very well. China very strong in already electric vehicles. 5G, AI, renewable, and on, so on, except semiconductors. That's kind of China's hilarious gun of uh, uh, industrial uh, strengths. The why we are making such force about semiconductors from both US and China? Because this is security issues. Today, semiconductor capability determine your future military capability. So the missile technology today is using 20 years ago semiconductor technology. That means today's semiconductor technology determine 20 years latest missile technology. It's a 20 years lag. That's why US is so uh, sensitive about the China catch up in semiconductor. That's why US won against Soviet Union is a uh, Cold War. So at the time, uh, Soviet missile was following the fixed flight path. But it was U.S. missile calculating its own path until they hit the target. That's the way how U.S. won the war against Soviet Union, <laughs> Cold War. U.S. wanted to replace the same pattern against China. That's why U.S. is so sensitive about semiconductor technology or computing power technologies. Okay. If you lose today, it will determine tomorrow's military capabilities. So this is so semiconductors is not only economic but also more importantly security issues, military issues. Okay. Then how about position position by Korea Taiwan in this uh, split two or G two tension? It could be both good and bad. Also some opportunities. First objection, first perception is that we think yes because we have stopped Chinaization of GBC. Everything become made in China, but you have stopped it <laughs> at least in a couple of sectors. Okay, so uh, when I go to Taiwan, they said, okay, if US China go together very well, they don't look at China, they don't look at Taiwan, they don't look at Korea. Only they fight each other, they pay attention to Taiwan. That's what the Taiwan people say. <laughs> okay, so actually, if you don't buy from manufacturing from China, they have to buy from Korea or Taiwan. Only sources, manufacturing supplies especially semiconductors. So in the sense, uh, the position by Korea time become uh, more spotlighted than during peaceful times. Of course, we are facing dilemma of big market in China versus access to Western technology. So Korea, still China big market, but we rely on West, US for access to technologies. But China market become, as mentioned, become more and more, it's big, but it's not your market. <laughs> So in the sense, access to technology become more important than access to market in China. Okay, that's our current judgment in Korea. Okay, but globally or aggregate terms, the world with protectionism or 
It's bad for Korea time because we are relying on free trade for economic prosperity. Korea is the only country in the world which has free trade with the US, China, India, and EU. Only country in the world. But that trade regime is now stopped working. It's bad for Korea and small <coughs> trading-based countries. But some country, uh, some uh, factors, uh, some firms and sectors having big benefit from this US-China uh, uh, split. Because in a sense, if US market is closed for China, it's market for Korea, Taiwan. If China market is closed for US company, it's market for Korea, Taiwan, in a sense. So Korea, Taiwan could have both hand in both market, could have upper hand in both market. Then by bad scenarios. Okay, some, but not every sectors, not every firm, but some firms. Yeah. For example, in the August uh, 2020, 22nd uh, IR Act, it's a big subsidy for uh, many made in America goods in environmentally uh, uh, friendly goods. And uh, uh, it's a big incentive for EV, for batteries. The biggest beneficiary Korean company, and biggest loser was China CATL, number one global company. They market share, market valuation decreased more than 20%, whereas LG Energy Solution, Samsung HDI market valuation increased more than 30% after this IRI Act. Even solar cell panel makers, China used to be almost 98% market share, but current campaign was dying out of competition to China, but now they are uh, turning around after this IREC, which reduced almost 70% to cost of current company making uh, solar cell and so on. So in the sense, some current company very happy about this <laughs> IREC. <laughs> okay. Of course, it's a double tier regulation of the violation of WTO rule for free trade, but good for some Korean battery makers and so. So that's why building more and more factory in the US. Then the chips act, which is about semiconductor, is another boost for Korea Taiwan. Uh, it also checked rise of Chinese, but also expanding more demand for Korean Taiwan products. On the right side, I have shown the date of investment into US from all over the world. South Korea alone invests more than whole Europe okay. in terms of certain size investment. Okay, so China, Korea has 20 projects with more than 100 million uh, worth. And Europe has, whole Europe has 90. So this huge investment into coming to uh, US is because source is South Korea and uh, Japan and Taiwan and so on. Okay. And same time, chips act restrict. You cannot export certain technology to China. Logic chips, but if you use less than 15, 14 nanometer process, you cannot export to China. DRAM, 18 nanometer low, you can export. Land flash, you can export. 128 more layers uh, chips. Okay. Also, you cannot export EUB. EUB is most important machine to make semiconductor. It's monopoly by Dutch company, ASL. Okay. EUB most important. This is more critical factor for China's rise in semiconductors. Okay. Together with the software, which is monopoly by US companies. So this shows a uh, key value chain in semiconductors. There are key players. First one is the, the overall comprehensive uh, is it okay? Okay. So, so this is like Samsung, who are making everything, including design uh, and so on. But fabulous is where US strong, so like AMD, not NVIDIA. Uh, the, they are they are they are just design company manufacturing done by Korea Taiwan. It is strong. Boundary is only production. That's the Taiwan TSMC. Then we have a software company which always is very strong. Okay. ARM and so on. Then equipment device is Dutch company, ASML, is number one. Then material is Japanese is uh, very strong. So in a sense. Korea Taiwan making chips using US designs, Japanese materials, and Dutch machines. <laughs> this is value chain of semiconductor. But who are getting most value added profit among this is US company. 
wellness campaign, design campaign. Samsung, TSMC, their volume is big, but not much profit. Profit is going to US company. So you should be happy about this. But US not trying to say everything come to US. This is too much from East Asian point of view. <laughs> OK. And these are three main chips in semiconductor. DRAM, NAND flash, logic chips. DRAM is for computers, credit card. NAND flash, your USB drive is NAND flash. Logic chips is uh, like brain of computers and uh, many uh, AI applications. Okay. And who are the main players? DRAM is Samsung. Logic chips is TSMC. NAND flash is more diverse. Samsung, TSMC, even Chinese company. Why China company? Because NAND flash is lowest least um, lowest entry barriers. It doesn't require EVB, EUB. If you don't have EUB, this okay, you can make still NAND flash. But to make high-end DRAM logic, you need EUB. Without EUB, you cannot be competitive. That's why US restrict the equipment supply to China. Okay. So what is EUB? EUB is a ultraviolet lithography machine. It's a monopoly by ASML. What, but does, what does it do? It does some technical thing I can, yeah. But without that, you cannot have a fine processing of chips. Yeah. Without that, you have your efficiency very, very inefficient. So the old version is DUB. China is DUB, but it's still uh, not that highly productive. So uh, we went to Samsung factory uh, last June with Ha and some user uh, colleagues, I asked in person on a Samsung engine, how many EUB do we have? He said, 50. I asked my China colleague, how many EUB in China? He said, zero. How many in Taiwan? I asked the, asked the TSMC. They have 200 <laughs> in TSMC. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. But China is DUB, old version of EUB. If DUB, they can still make chips, but with very inefficient uh, uh, productivity. That's why the Huawei recently said they, they, they developed seven nano chips based mobile phone. How come? They use DUB. But it, commercially, it's, it doesn't make sense. But you can, they can still sell in China with, with the subsidy of the military purpose. It's OK. But you cannot compete in the global market with the DUB based chips. Okay. So in Chinese company, uh, the CXMT, Changshin, they catch up to 17, uh, 19 nanometer uh, process compared to uh, Samsung is already 12 nanometer. In logic chips, the TSM is going into two nanometer based process, but Chinese front is 14, but they say recently we have developed seven nanometer, and which is not using EUB, which so is not commercially that much viable. I checked the actual number of US patent in semiconductors. Samsung is number because Samsung patent broadly compared to TSMC. China patent is very small, but speed is very uh, rapid catching up. YNT is producing land flash. They uh, patent grows very speed, very fast. CXMT, which is making DRAM, far below Samsung, but still uh, the, they're filing more and more patent in US. So they're catching up. So what's the prospect of China in catching up leapfrogging? Whether China can follow Korean strategy of catching up against Japan? Korea caught up Japan by leapfrogging. In other words, Korea built next generation facility ahead of Japan. But that was passed because Korea imported the old equipment from over our global world. So Korea built next generation factory ahead of Japan. That's why Korea leapfrog over Japan. But that strategy or leapfrogging is not possible for China because they can import equipment. So whenever they build factory, it becomes outdated because frontier company moving further ahead, next generation. Okay. And EUB, China can develop EUB, is almost impossible. Require more than uh, 
50 different types of bacterial component and soft is all monopoly by US content. Okay. This shows how Korea uh, caught up Japan. So uh, early days all Intel, NEC, Toshiba was read up but from 64 megabyte, Korea uh, took over Japan uh, by building next generation. Korea built this factory during the downturn period, where Japan was cautious in making investment in downturn period. So Korea made investment during downturn, thereby took over the market. And another reason that DRAM is difficult to catch up is that this shows the price of new generation memory sticks. Uh, when new generation appeared, all generation price go to zero. In other words, there is no high end low end because typically China catching up first low end, they build power, they move on to high end. But memory DRAM, there is only one end. So you cannot play game of entry in low end, then later move on high end. So in chips, the low end chips price go below zero when new generation chips appears. You can see your USB, same the bigger capacity USB comes with old capacity USB disappear to market. Yeah. Okay. That's why China uh, having difficulty, more difficulty in catching up in DRAM. Okay. But that doesn't mean China has no hope. China can try to catch up in then the flash memory, whereas entry base low, no need for EUB. And also they can play logic chips, low end chips. So DRAM is only one end. When logic chips, there are diverse end, low end, high end. High end is by TSMC. Low end for automobile, they are low end chips. So China still making money in low end chips. But low end chips is also big, big market nowadays. Okay. So low end chips, you don't need to have a less than 10 nanometer process. You need to have only 20 to 30 nanometer base process. It's okay to make chips for automobiles and electricity and so on. That's what SMIC, uh, Shanghai Manufacturing Corporation, making money in foundry in serving the low end uh, chips market. And they are doing okay. This shows financial data of SMIC, YMTC, who are making land flashy, and Naura and IMG who are making various equipment and component. They are all making progress in sales and profit. So financially, they're okay. <laughs> China market is better because it's served, served by American company or Japanese company, but they, that is cut. A Chinese uh, uh, company should buy from locally. So some uh, Chinese company having bigger growth sales after this US restriction of. So many US companies in semiconductor complaining that who are selling equipment in semiconductors, but they cannot sell to China. Okay. So China companies having that uh, demand. So China is catching up strongly in many diverse equipment and component of semiconductors. And this shows number of DRAM patent. Japan is one one, but Japan saying uh, experiencing collapse, the rise of Korea and the rise of PSMI. But China is catching up at least number of patent. Okay. In logic chips, uh, Japan still number one, but the game is getting smaller because rise of uh, Korea and Taiwan. Also, China is catching up too, at least number of patent. They, they are filing patent in low end chips. Okay. But this only number, quantity, but if you look at quality, which is measured by how many citations you receive is a patent. It's patent like a journal articles, quality measured by impact factors. China is absolutely uh, dominant, and China is at the bottom in terms of quality. Graph looks not that clear, but so I made up this table showing quantity, quality, and power, which is some uh, multiple of quantity times quality. So in the regard, I have a DRAM, NAND flash system, logic chips total. China's quantity is about 70% of average of Korea, Taiwan. Quality lower than that, like 60 or lower. Together, technical power, China is only now half of Korea Thai averages. Okay, in terms of technical power, which is 
quantity times quality of a patent. Okay. But important thing is that base of catch up very fast in China. As mentioned on this graph, uh, China catching up very fast in terms of quantity, at least. But quality is still low. Okay. And lastly, the what are happening in Korean company and China company? Uh, they have big plant in home, but the Samsung has no plant of DRAM abroad. Samsung keep their core competence DRAM always in Korea. No plant in US, no plant in China. Only China they have a land place, which is low entry barriers. US they are building boundary to compete with TSMC, but never uh, DRAM factory abroad. Taiwan, TSMC, they have a big capacity high end in home, more than 1.3 million unit wafer production and uh, three nanometer below. But US, they build only 50K capacity unit, much smaller than Taiwan. And also five nanometer, about one or two generation lagged one. China, they have only one Nanjing factory, uh, about uh, 100K capacity, but still much lower than whole capacity in Taiwan. So my uh, conclusion is that uh, Taiwan keeps high-end, big capacity at home, low-end, small capacity abroad. So in that sense, Taiwan is managing this change in uh, GBC on their own uh, plant. Okay. Then let me conclude the three uh, chart. First, if you summarize semiconductor, so as I mentioned, common strategy or response by Korea Tan is that high-end, big capacity at home, low-end, small capacity abroad. So there might be less need for concern about global oversupply situation. And also, chip is ever expanding the demand with the AI and so. Before, chip was only for mobile phone PC, but now everything becomes the chip-based. Explosion of demand. When I went to Samsung factory in with Ha, they are building more back, more more factory in uh, uh, south of Seoul. <laughs> I said, do you have any worry about overcapacity? They said, no, we have no worry about overcapacity. <laughs> they are building more in Korea too, more in Texas. <laughs> also, they uh, keep core part in Korea. Now we will we'll see next generation PC. PC will be all now become AI based PC. It's the next generation PC coming up. We all need the chips. Okay. And so, in a way, uh, in semiconductors, US measures has, has some impact. In other words, it slows down the speed of China catching up and possibly to believe problem. And increase status of uh, Korea and Taiwan. In some US patent, China catching up very fast in quantity, but slow in quality. So end the mixed catch up in technological power. But in, but in some areas, AI, China is catching up very rapidly. So I would say China catch up speed is determined by entry barriers. DRAM, high entry barriers, very difficult to catch up. High-end logic chips, TSM dominance, high entry barriers. But China catching up in land flash, and low-end logic chips serving automobile and diverse uh, applications. And also, China companies are financially okay. They are making profit, increasing sales due to uh, domestic market is now captured by domestic supplies because American company cannot serve China market. American company very strong in component and equipment, but they cannot sell to China. So. Uh, American Semiconductor Association complained heavily to US government about these measures. <laughs> they worry about their losing all China market eventually. So it's mixed success for US point of view. They are uh, successing in security wise, technology wise, but not they're leaving China market to Chinese firm companies, replacing foreign suppliers. But at the same time, China product cannot go to global market. Too much China specific technology and uh, specification. So it's good for Korea Taiwan because world market is still uh, left for East Asian companies. A broad conclusion is that uh, China catch US was somewhat derailed 
short-term success by U.S., but we cannot be sure about long-term consequences. China catching up still uh, strong in many display, battery, electric cars, but at least very uncertain in semiconductors. U.S. making success in achieving security goal of slowing down China, but in military and so on, but not much success in stopping China economy catching up, as seen by uh, strong sale by Chinese companies. So you can say the prospect is that not full but partial decoupling of U.S.-China or de-risking, in other words, reducing reliance on China GBC, we can be free from all made in China product. And U.S. trying to build up your own uh, GBC high tech, but it might take time. U.S. lost all memory of doing manufacturing, so trying to bring back, it takes time. Korea building factory in U.S., uh, and I'm there, they're using all the Korean product. In TSMC factory in US, they are bringing all Thailand engineers, <laughs> no engineer in US. <laughs> so they train, they sent 1,000 Thai engineers to US, then another 1,000 to US. And they brought back US engineer to Taiwan to train, and US engineer complained. <laughs> I don't want to go to Taiwan. So it's yeah, US uh, lack of uh, ecosystem of uh, manufacturing. So it might take time for US building up their own value chain in manufacturing. So Korean Thai getting benefit in some sectors, uh, but support from global protectionism. So although Samsung is happy, but Korea GDP growth rate last year, 1.5%, lower than US, lower than Japan. <laughs> Half of global average, the first time Korea be like that. So it means Korea suffering from rising protectionism globally. It's a bad environment, although some companies are happy. So I would say finally, we should uh, restore some new types of multinational multilateralism uh, with free or fair trade. We need to have more rule-based international competition, not uh, manipulated by any big powers. More predictable and uh, fair competition should be available. Otherwise, many middle powers, emerging countries suffer from big, uh, big guys fight. <laughs> okay. That's my uh, current assessment. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee, for providing such a clear explanation of such a complex issues. So from now on, audience are invited to raise comments and questions, please. Okay, Mary, please. Thank you so much for your very really interesting talk. Um, when I look at Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, I think the government was helpful in uh, the catch-up period. And then I think governments generally are not so helpful in the go-ahead period when I look at the data. So that raises a question about China. And I know we don't know China's doing very well, but I always have the question of not incremental improvements, incremental innovation, but will the communist system, just your thinking, be real successful in sort of radical innovation or disruptive yeah. invention? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think there's any question that China's going to catch up. I mean, I haven't thought that was a question for quite some time. To me, it's more mm -hmm. that go ahead question. So I'd love to hear okay. your thoughts about that. Okay. Can I answer or can collect some can or maybe any, any related questions to what the body said? Or maybe Mark raised hand too, so why don't you say it and we can I can combine this. Mark. Oh, okay. Yeah, my question was uh, a little bit different, much more specific. Right. I really want to hear the answer to your thoughts about this. Thank you for such a detailed presentation. I'm really looking forward to it when you publish this. I really want to study it because it's too much to take in. But my question was about the, the huge um, overseas investment, the free and overseas investment that you showed for a while. It's so impressive, so much bigger than the rest of the world. And, um, and my question is, um, What's driving that? You mentioned the big Korean investment into this country. Is that the biggest driver or 
where else is that investment going? And is it above all semiconductor mm -hmm. um, okay. industry? Yeah. Or is it in other domains also? Just what's how do you explain that? Okay. And how long has that been going on that, mm -hmm. that Korea has been um, in such an amazing position in regard to okay. international investment? So let me respond to this first question first. This question of China's possibility of conducting radical innovation, I think following the footsteps of Western, as is possible. Yeah. I'm very strong in the scientific research in terms of essay publication. China already topped, yes, in all the fields, IT, nano, and by already China's number of publication is much bigger than US. So based on that strength in pure science, China can try radically program. And China is, is working on that actually. They are saying that we'll deal with our technology, not relying on Western technology. They are aiming it clearly. They state that. So uh, in some time future, it might happen, but uh, it might take time in <laughs> China too. Because it's very recent situation, because this situation happened just last two years, three years. So uh, China start maybe late, so it might take uh, several years, at least 10 years especially more years in semiconductor. So they are trying to target semiconductor technology without relying on EUB, especially. They're talking about it. They said there's some report already, some progress made in China. But um, making really practically, making sense EUB is, is really uh, hard, very but very uh, difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Because also you need, to, you need software. Software all dominated by US company. And if UB is made by Dutch company, they rely on many other sources. It's, it's combined product. Very complicated. So theoretically possible, but finally developing commercially viable product uh, is very difficult. <laughs> yeah. At least in semiconductors. But China making progress in other areas, electric vehicles, and many China doing very well. Yeah, very well. Yeah. Also, the uh, yeah, the how come Korea invest more than whole EU? <laughs> and uh, first of all, the Korean jebels who are driving this FDI inflow, they are very fast. So when there are market change, regulation change, they are the first of who quick to respond, maybe quicker than uh, more cautious European uh, companies. And uh, Korea, US as FTA, as many uh, privilege coming to Korean company, even before chips and uh, IRA. So also Samsung has already some small foundry factory in Texas. So it's not that difficult Samsung build second factory in Texas area. That's why Samsung is better in TSMC. TSMC is building new factory, new location. So TSM, I think more difficult than Samsung. Samsung has already built uh, some ecosystem in Texas areas. So they said that it's okay for them to expand the existing experiences. Okay. I also went to Hyundai Kia factory in Georgia. And uh, around that is all Korean company supplying to the assemblers. No, Amer only one American company. All other Korean company came to together with Hyundai. So the Korean net ecosystem just transferred to US territory. <laughs> In semiconductor factory in uh, Texas, all built by Samsung's construction company. Yeah. Yeah. So at that time, uh, US prospect to building up, restoring the value chain, it might take time. So some US jobs, but it might take time, US building up their own manufacturing ecosystem. Well, one of the original founders of Samsung was Sidney basically said, when you hit 80%, uh, of the dominant powers, powers, you go to war, that you have military power. Mm -hmm. So we're not there yet. Uh, we will never get there. <laughs> but that argues for a logic of security versus a logic of economic efficiency. Mm -hmm. So it would argue for China developing a technology that's incompatible with U.S. standards, mm. uh, and so uh, that would also argue for uh, assuming China 
continues to sell to Africa, and mm -hmm. America, and Asia, uh, that you're we're going to divide up global markets, mm -hmm. uh, which works fundamentally against your your conclusion about the need for uh, effective WTO, which the U.S. doesn't want, uh, as well as in some ways China doesn't. Want. So mm -hmm. we're to sort of take the conclusion that you are putting out here, that while the economics profession is going to push for free trade and, mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. uh, the world is, is <laughs> giving up on that more. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. the question really is, is there any way to bridge this or not? Uh, and if so, how do we do that? That's mm -hmm. a very important question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me just add something yeah, yeah. to that. Yeah. When I was listening to your lecture, I thought the two layers of the economic system, one is the uh, regular production, well, goods production versus the high-tech uh, is semiconductor. So is it possible uh, to imagine some kind of coexistence uh, as on the one end, uh, uh, free trade at the production Good production level, the high tech wise, more protectionism, something. So, yeah, so all the my. In other words, <laughs> based upon what David said, well, I said, uh, why did, did you conclude that, uh, I mean, advocate for rule based uh, international kind of order? Uh, based upon your arguments or presentation, I don't see much prospect for it. It's true. So although I say at the moment, at the last moment, I say some normative uh, Polish ideas, that's very normative, <laughs> but uh, not realistic in terms of current situation going on. So I think we are facing big challenges because it is negative sum game for everybody to keep binding each other. Yeah. Not only for two big powers, but also third countries, all negatively affected by this fight between two big giants. So regionally, we have to think some alternatives, but we don't know how it can be reached. That's a big challenge for not only the policy, but also all academics too. We have to divide a new economic thinking or social science thinking, how to uh, respond to this new environment. I think the new environment, uh, the global budget will be going on for at least a couple of decades, I guess, I think. Yeah. So uh, it's a big challenge for all social sciences. How to think about this uh, situation? What's the uh, what solution? What, 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 what would you say as intellectuals or academicians? Yeah. Any other comments? Yeah. 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 Yeah, we'll well, um, I know you, your focus wasn't quite as much on Japan, but I'm just curious um, what effect the important relationship between Japan and Korea has had on this ecosystem of chips and semiconductors, and mm -hmm. how do you think, mm -hmm. how do you think? That relationship could further benefit or possibly put it at risk. Okay, yeah, actually, as I mentioned briefly, the Korea's rise in semiconductor, we should thank Japan providing inside all the design and all the equipment. And so, still, we are relying heavily on Japanese materials. Japan is still strongest players in this uh, value chain, the, this part. The supply of equipment, devices, and, and so on. Japan and Tokyo are very strong. So, but during the, some history war between Korea and Japan, Japan tried to cut export of the key material to Korea in semiconductors. And Korea used that momentum to localize production in, in Korean uh, product. It's uh, some success, but still the, uh, it's only mixed success. In that regard, Japan very important as supply to Korean semiconductor value chain. So nowadays, the new environment, Japan and Korea become much better than before. So uh, in that sense, we restored the corporate relation between uh, Japan and Korea, also with the US. US pushing two countries should get good terms again. It's not happening. Mm -hmm. So in the sense, it's a two split GBC. Yeah. 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 So uh, nowadays, uh, Korean Japan is very good in, in economic, uh, business, and, polit and politics, and so on. So it's a, New world is happening. Yeah. Any, yeah, please. So, look in in your metric for gauging future potential 
in technological development seems to be relying on scientific papers published on patents. Um, was that were your patent data? Was that patents applied for, or was that patents accepted by? It's a uh, granted in the U.S. Okay, USPTO, granted, okay. granted patent. Um, just because I know in terms of scientific papers, China, yes, they pub Chinese scientists have published the most, More. but there's also been rejected or retracted mm -hmm. a lot of the published papers and mm -hmm. retracted more than from other countries. So I was just curious about whether that was accepted or rejected. Um, but in terms of patents, are you seeing certain areas in which different countries are filing patents or are they all filing equally innovative, equally high-tech, okay. leading cutting-edge patents? Or is there some differentiation within that? Yeah, good question. I didn't mention, but uh, if in this graph, um, mm -hmm. I didn't say much, but if there is HP, HP is new types of DRAM, is high bandwidth memory. This is most usually in AI applications, very important. But this doesn't require EUB. So that's why China betting heavily in HP, already betting heavily. That's increasing HM patent by China. Very interesting. They know where, where they should go. <laughs> HP used to buy the the ND, NDBD, NDB, bigger demand HP, and now supplied by Samsung and Hynix, but China's trying to target it. They know. <laughs> okay, at this point, I want to raise the uh, more, more or less some sort of a big question or something. That is, you are, as I said earlier, you are a man of a catch-up economy. So given your long-time interest in, in studying catch-up economies, what, what we see here is kind of uh, interesting in that uh, we seem to argue that uh, it's almost impossible for China to catch up with the United States or other countries, uh, including in certain type of chips or something. Then compared to this round of catch up uh, to the previous uh, pattern of catch up, what are the differences or similarities between the two, at least the two different types of uh, catch ups? It's my first question. Mm -hmm. Second question is uh, more as an academic issue. Now you are very, one of the very rare in the economists who does both economics and security here. Quickly, so this kind of uh, then I I kind of sense that uh, you know under our current economic I mean the uh, academic system we don't have much uh, strong base or foundation to train those uh, people who could both could they keep themselves with the both uh, economics and security. Uh, so uh, don't you feel that uh, we need some sort of different uh, reshuffling now, I mean, the training system, education system, to suit uh, uh, to meet the needs for newly emerging interests uh, of uh, combining security and then economics? Okay. Yeah. So what's an important question in terms of research? So. Early days, China's model catch-up is similar to East Asian catch-up. In other words, basically, labor-intensive production, targeting export market. So basically, East Asian model, financed by Japan, Japan and Asian tiger model. So that's early version of China catch-up. But China become showing more unique China element, and that includes like uh, uh, M&As, international M&As. Samsung didn't do any M&A until they grow recently, whereas Google acquired one company per week, <laughs> more than 50 company acquisition. But China is using m and like Google. So China acquiring many high-tech companies globally in the same different from the Japan or East Asia model. So China acquired the Volvo, Swedish company. Mercedes-Benz is China equity here is very big. China acquired IBM ThinkPad. Many Western companies acquired China. That's interesting to me. Also they acquired many the mineral sources in Africa and so on. So in the sense, China is very quickly globalized in the sense their own version of building uh, GBCs. That's different from uh, East Asian uh, model of catching up. And also China very strong in academia. So many spin-off startups coming from academias, universities. That didn't happen in East Asia. In the sense, China more like US style of Silicon Valley model, many startups and MIT, Stanford, and many startups. The same thing happening Beijing University and Tsinghua University. In the sense, China is above the model, more like American model. In the sense, utilizing academia 
original research, original knowledge into commercial uh, ventures. So there's economic differences, but of course, uh, in security or politics, China is, uh, has a vision to become a global empire, they said. <laughs> They were China dream. They, they seeing the 2008 global crisis. They saw, oh, American system, they tried to emulate, but they said, oh, American system is very weak, very fragile system. And they said, well, Mao system better than American one. That's the China realization since 2008 global crisis. So China has their own vision. Our system might be better than US system. That's the recognition by Xi Jinping and the, his generation. In the sense, China trying to build their own empires, different from Western model of Western democracies. So in the sense, it's a spread in values, not only economics. Okay. So we need both economics and political scientists or sociology history uh, to tackle these new uh, issues getting more important. So in the past, economists never meet with the political scientists in seminars, but we have many seminars happening collecting both discipline, many discipline come together. Very interesting phenomenon. That means, uh, as mentioned, we have to um, create new, uh, I don't know, the curriculum or <laughs> discipline. And best part might be international school like Jackson or others, international school better than the economics, uh, separate discipline based part. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. I actually wanted to follow up on <laughs> because I'm big, of course, um, really interested in your Schumpeterian approach. You know, we discussed this earlier and I'm I'm struck um, by your role in influential policy advising councils as a Schumpeterian oriented economist. And I I can't imagine a Schumpeterian oriented economist in top policy advising circles in our own <laughs> country. So maybe you have some comment about that. I, I just uh, find that curious. Okay. For me, the Biden policy of doing IRA chips act is kind of old style industrial policy, you know, providing only monetary incentives. That's old style, East Asian style. The new style of energy policy is doing like a, uh, joint consortium R&D, mobilizing both public private resources and knowledge and so on. Those are the more new types of innovation policies, but that part is not much discussed in the US, very strange. Yes, of the old style in the in this Polish happened in past of Korea or past Japan. <laughs> so we moved to move beyond that, doing more uh, the, the joint R and D between public and uh, private sector together. And we should do. I mean, you know, you know, US should not protect the uh, using market, but they should target next generation technology. They should develop next generation technology by US joint effort. That's what you should do. Yeah. Rather than just providing incentives, <laughs> financial incentives to attract FDI from abroad, they should develop their own local R&D consortium and R&D initiatives. Right? Target new generation technology, ahead of Korea, ahead of, Japan, ahead of Taiwan. <laughs> yes, have a capacity to do that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh. Uh, I wonder if I could bring in some different examples that, that might challenge some of what you said. So you, you end up with South Korea and Taiwan having the fifth position. And yet South Korea's growth rate was below the global yeah. average. Mm -hmm. Taiwan's growth rate last year was below the global average. And I wonder if one of the issues might be that these are compared to China and the United States relatively small countries mm. and they're dominated by TSMC in Taiwan's case, mm. Samsung, uh, Hyundai, mm. Phoenix, in the Korean case, mm. and that, that that dominance is in fact a real danger for the economies and the long-term prosperity in these countries, mm. even though they have lower inequality than in the United States. Mm. You know, the United States and, and China are not mm. nearly as dependent Mm. on these for uh, on any one firm or two mm. or three firms mm -hmm. as South Korea and Taiwan. Mm. So it's natural, as you say, that they would want open economic systems, perhaps, mm -hmm. but that if the systems are closing down, they're in more vulnerable positions than would be the case. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, let me start 
pointing this graph again. Where is US? Why not drawing US? Because US far above this line, far above this line. <laughs> US patterns far above this uh, couple of thousand more. So we are still dominant <laughs> also because it's US pattern. But anyway, technically US source is super uh, powerful than East Asian, including Japan and South Korea. Also, the US much more diversified than small economy like uh, Taiwan and Korea. Taiwan is more so, at least Korean economies are doing also bioscience, biotechnology. So all Korean jobs are moving into bio out of IT. So plant line diversify. Also, because small market size, they they because of that, they're forcing into foreign country globalization, targeting European market, US market aggressively. That's the only way they can diversify. So they try to diversify market, although because their market, domestic market is very small. That's why another reason, yes, why massive investment by Korean company, yes. So everything is like that. Korea try to be diversified. Yes. Okay, uh, is that the hot falling catch up the only way for China in the semiconductor area? Can I, can China achieve the hot rating catch up or stage scaling catch up? And also, like, is, the, is this means the assessment to explicit knowledge much more as the, the most important factors in the uh, in the semiconductor in the semiconductor area? Mm, okay, so he is taking my class. So yes, give me a screenshot. <laughs> Okay, so as you mentioned, uh, in the catch-up pattern, there are several patterns. One is that fast following, following the incumbent. The other is stage skipping. You skip some stages of uh, pass. The other is pass creating, mid forking. So China can try both the fast following or stage skipping and fast creating. And radical innovation is possible when there is a uh, knowledge is more explicit or codified knowledge, knowledge can be expressed by text or code. When knowledge of test knowledge, which cannot be patentable, then you cannot copy test knowledge. It's more difficult. Semiconductor, in the one sense, codified knowledge is based on scientific research, but production is a lot of involving test knowledge. That's why it's difficult to catch up in a small uh, quick speed. So in the sense, semiconductor is quite different from more complicated, complicated than other sectors in terms of catching a speed, high entry barriers. Anyhow, with that uh, note, uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, all, with all of you. Uh, to, uh,